So now that we have our super basic schematic made, we're going to click on this icon right here, which uh, generates our board view. Um, if we already did have a board view generated, it will merely just switch over to it. I'm going to click this button. It's going to ask us if we want to create it from the schematic, which we do. So the whole reason why we made the schematic. So I'm going to press yes. And there we are. It opens a second window here. Now, important thing to note about Eagle is there is a schematic window and there's also the board window. You also see other windows as well, such as maybe a library editing window or whatever. But it's very, 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 very important to remember that you must keep your schematic window and your board window both open at the same time at all times. Um, if you do not, you will break your uh, backwards uh, annotation. And basically what that means is that there will be a, um, these two files are implicitly linked. Um, the schematic tells the board view which components are going to be attached to which other components and how that's going to happen. Uh, the board gives you the nitty gritty of actually making those connections. But if, the, but if the schematic does not exist or the schematic is incorrect, it's going to basically give the board incorrect connections and it's not going to transfer that information over. Both of them are completely dependent on the other and you must keep them both open at the same time. So I'm going to uh, bring my board view open and here we go. So here's the board view. Um, and if you would, um, yeah, okay, so as you can see, there is my actual board area, which has this white outline over here on the right hand side, and on the left are all the components that I added. Um, so if I use the move tool by typing in move and pressing enter, and clicking once again on that sort of crosshair, this time it's on the bottom left hand corner of the component, then it gives me the shield, which I can move. Now, in Eagle, in the free version of Eagle, everything must exist within this inner sort of workspace area. If I tried to place the board over here, it's going to throw an error and tell me that it can't. If I try to place it over here, the same thing is going to happen. Now this can get kind of a little bit frustrating because let's say I place it in, I decide I want to move it a little bit, I move it again, and I decide I'm going to put it over here while I connect other things to get it out of the way. Well, you actually won't let me do that. It will only let me keep it in this area. The only time it can ever exist outside of your sort of little project box there is when the, the, the component is first initialized and first created and then it's plopped down in this left hand area right here. So I'm going to arbitrarily just sort of place the shield in the bottom left hand corner here. Um, it doesn't really, um, yeah, so I want to kind of line up these, these origin lines with, with the, um, the border of the shield. It'll make things easier later on. And then you can see all these little yellow lines here. So the yellow lines are basically um, their uh, net classes. And um, what they tell you is they tell you which things should be attached to which other things. Okay. So as you can see, it's basically telling me that this right pin of the LED switch header right here should be attached to this pin right here on the Arduino. Um, so we're going to take our components and we're going to basically place them on the board. And we're going to place them relatively close to where they're connected. We don't want to have things far away. So it's a good, good practice to have things as close as, as we can get them. So I'm going to place our two headers right over here. We got our resistor. So I'm going to place this one like maybe right there. I'm going to place this one right here. And then um, this guy we're going to place right over here. And I opted to put it closest to his connection um, to the Arduino, which I should, I should probably do with this as well. And as you can see, there's no real way for us to get everything really close to each other because of the pins we decided to use. Um, but this will definitely um, work. <laughs> All right, so now that we have the components placed. Um, the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to start routing and making connections between them. So now that we're in the board view, we do not use net. We actually use route instead. So if I type in route, it gives me the routing tool. And it gives me the option up here of which layer I want to route on top on. So I can either route on the top of the board or the bottom of the board. And that's just physically uh, the top layer or the bottom layer. So in general, um, you want to kind of start most of your routing on the top um, and then, you know, put other stuff on the bottom. And in general, you want to run your routes on one way on the top and then the opposite way on the bottom. So we'll try to kind of roughly follow those conventions. Um, we also are given the same routing options as we saw in the schematic view as far as uh, how it deals with angles and turns. <coughs> we also get um, an option for changing the width of our traces. And we want to kind of tend towards uh, wider traces um, when we can and only use smaller traces if we have to. Um, it'll just run into uh, less complications down the road. 
Wonderful. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And I'm just going to basically click on one end of these, these connections. And it's going to give me my, um, my net class that I'm routing here. And I'm just going to click on the other side of the resistor. It's going to beep at me. And it's connected. So I'm going to do that for all these, you know, really basic sort of connections here. When the components are right next to each other. Right. I'll connect that as well. And then, um, excellent. So let's say that I want to um, do a trace on the bottom here for um, for the. Let's, let's say that horizontally I'm going to do the top, and then for the bottom I'm going to do vertically. So I'm going to actually delete that um, this one um, vertical trace here. I'm going to type in DL, bring up my delete tool, and I'm going to click on the line here. Oh, I'm sorry, so this brings up a good point, actually. So the delete tool is going to um, try to delete the connection between the components. So this is actually what we don't want. So we want to use the rip up tool. Um, so the rip up tool basically takes um, traces that have been placed down and they kind of um, rip them up and temporarily remove them while maintaining the connection that existed before. So you see the rip up tool allows me to uh, delete that con the, um, the trace but leaves the connection, all right? So now I'm going to click on my route again, or type in route, and then I'm going to go to the bottom. I'm going to click here and up here. And you can see this a different color. So the bottom layer is going to be blue and the top layer is um, red. So um, for this connection as well, which is pretty much vertical, I'm going to do the same thing. And you can see if, if I were to keep the square, it would, it would short you know, this connection down here and cause some issues. So I'm going to right click. Oh, I like the looks of that one, so I'm going to use that guy. All right, click. We're all good to go. <clears throat> Connect this as well. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to kind of right click a few times until I find something I like. All right, I like that. <coughs> and then we have our um, final connection here. I'm just going to kind of shimmy around. All right, fantastic. So it appears that everything is connected on our board. Now there's a way for us to find out. So if we click on rat's nest, <coughs> we're going to basically look to see if any of those yellow lines appear. Uh, rat's nest is going to recalculate those, the geometry of those lines, and it will connect components to the next closest component of that bus. So um, the way that it works is if, if, for instance, this resistor is attached to these two resistors, um, you're only going to see basically one line going to whichever resistor is the closest, as opposed to two lines going to each one of those if the bus name is the same. Um, so that checked out. We had no issues there. And then we're going to go to ERC. So ERC stands for Electrical Rule Checks. So this is going to bring up anything where it's like, hey, the schematic says that this component is supposed to be connected to that component. But in your board view, that component is not connected to that component. There's an error. And it's going to give you various other types of errors as well. So let's see what it has to say. So we can see that we actually had no errors. We had no real major issues. But we do have a few warnings. So the warning, it says, and if you double click on it, it should bring you to the warning. It looks like maybe it only does it for the errors. Uh, so it says, hey, your part LED has no value. Well, that kind of makes sense because it's an LED. We, we don't really want to give it a value. But we could if we wanted. So if we went in here, if we um, switched over to our schematic view. Oh, there it is. So, so there it's showing it doesn't have value. And if we type in value and then click on our LED, we can say blue. And that's going to be our blue LED. And then we have a value. Let's say, say for our LED switch, we want to say it's a single pole, single throw LED switch. So SPST. And then, all right, so now we know it's a single pole, single throw. This brings up a good point. We actually did forget to do our resistor values as well. So I'm going to type in value. And then I'm going to just simply click on the resistor and give it a value. So with the pull downs, we usually want those to be 10K. And it does recognize K or R or M. And it will. Um, you know, basically transfer it to 10,000. Um, and then we want our current limiting to be, um, let's say just like 500 ohms, so 500 R. And then down here for our current limiting here, we're just gonna say 630 R. All right, fantastic. So, we are Um, so yeah, let's run the electrical rule check again. And look, it says no errors or warnings. Board schematic are consistent. 
But all the warnings it gave us had to do for the values not existing. You can actually see now that we have the 500R printed on our silk screen, which is this gray area here. And it gives us a little bit of feedback for when we're assembling the board. Um, fantastic. So now that we have everything kind of connected, we check the electrical rules. Next thing we want to do is we want to uh, check the design rules. Now in order to do this, we actually have to specifically get the design rule from whatever fabricator we want to use. So let's say we want to use Oshpark here. So I'll type in oshpark.com. I'll bring them to the website. And if we click on design rules on the top here, then it says, hey, we got design rules for EcoCAD, blah, blah, blah. You can generate your own Gerber files. You can contact us, blah, blah, blah. But down here it says you can download our Eagle DRU file. So DRU file is basically a file from these fabricators that contains information about what sort of circuit board they can actually manufacture. Uh, so they do have limitations as far as like drill size and how thick the copper is and all that sort of good stuff. Um, so the DRU file is, is what tells us all that information. You can see I downloaded it here. I'll just show Show on Finder. All right, excellent. So I open up a new Finder window, and where I want to put this file is I want to go to Applications, um, and then there's our Eagle folder here, and there's a DRU folder within that, which contains all the design rules. You can see that I actually already copied uh, this this over. Oops. Um, but yeah, you're just gonna want to drag this over. And then you have the DRU file for that manufacturer. Um, all right, so excellent. So now if I go down to DRC, then it brings up our DRC window. So um, we're gonna go down to load and we're gonna tell it which design rules to use. So I'm gonna click on the one that we just transferred over and hit okay. And then I loaded up the Lean's PCB order design rules, right? You can go through these tabs and see what the design rules are actually designating. So this is saying, um, you know, the minimum uh, widths for, for the traces and how far away they can be from each other and all this sort of very interesting information, which you can edit yourself. Uh, but um, you're going to click on check here, and it's going to check your layout design to these design rules and make sure you're not violating any of the rules that are put forth. And we can see down at the bottom it says DRC, no errors, fantastic, so we're good to go. Now there's a few last little things that we may want to do before sending off to the fabricator. Uh, first thing is we want to maybe put a little bit of custom silkscreen information on here. So we're going to type in text to bring up the text um, generator. And we're going to say um, design by MTIID. I'm going to hold down shift and press enter to so go to the next line. Um, I'm going to say spring 2016. I'm going to shift and enter and uh, type in interface forever. All right, and then press enter. And then you can see that I basically have all that text attached to my pointer here. Now by default, it's actually gonna be um, on the bottom layer here, and it's gonna basically show up in the same way that these traces are. In order to change that, we're gonna click on this drop down menu here, and we're gonna go to um, <coughs> T, um, let me see which one is it here, uh, T names works. So the T basically means it's gonna be on the top layer, and the names is basically, it's gonna be the name version of the silk screen. Now, all these gray ones are silk screen. So once I do that, you can see that the text is now um, no longer mirrored and it's showing up in this gray font. So I can just basically click wherever I want that text to be placed and the text is on the board. Now let's say I want to sort of add a little bit of additional stuff to, to this as well to kind of help me out in the process of putting it together. For instance, I have our LED right here, but once the board is manufactured and given to us, there's no real way for, for me to determine which side is the positive side and which side is the negative side. Now I do know that um, one side of the LED is connected directly to power. Let's look at the schematic here. Or, um, oh, uh, connected directly to the read pin. And the other one is connected uh, to ground here. So if we go back to the board, we know that the one with the resistor next to it is ground. So I'm gonna type in text. I'm going to just do GND there and, and hit enter. And now it says ground. And I can place that on the pin that is ground. And I'm going to change the size here, make it a bit smaller. And I can hold down the Alt key to, to give me a smaller grid to work with. And I'll place it right there. So now I have a little reminder hey, the LED is here. This is the ground side. And I'm good to go. All right, excellent. 
Now the last thing we may want to do is we may want to add a ground pour to our board. Now ground pour basically is a um, completely is a layer of copper uh, that is not etched away that covers the majority of the board and this is usually used for a ground and it allows the ground to be more stable and for the circuitry to just be more stable in, in general and kind of have less electrical noise and less issues once you assemble it. So this so, so is actually a very good idea for basically all boards. Um, now to do this we actually use the polygon tool. So if I type in poly, I'll bring up the polygon tool, you can also click on this button down here. And then I'm going to uh, go to our, our layers here and I'm going to click on the top layer. And then what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to trace around the border of this board. And I'm going to click on the bottom here, click on the top. And then I click at the, the, the spot where I just began. If I do that, you'll see that it turns into this sort of dotted line here. And then I'm going to do this one more time, but instead of doing it on the top, I'm going to do it on the bottom. I'm going to click on the corner, go around where I started, and we're good to go. All right, and now I'm going to use the name tool. So I'm going to type in name. And then if I click on the, the border, the outline of these uh, polygons that I just created, if components are on top of each other, it will give it will basically go through a cycling phase. It will be like, it will bring one component to the front and kind of ask you if that's the one you want. If it is the one you want, you click again. If it's not, then you right click and it will cycle to the next component. As you can see, I'm right clicking here and it's just cycling between the two. Once I want to select one, I, I single click again and then it allows me to change the name. Now all I have to do is change the name from N3 to GND, which is the name of our ground bus. Now as soon as I do that, it actually connects, it It makes that polygon a part of the ground pour. I'm going to do, do it again for um, the, the top, oops, I already did it for that one, so I'm going to do it for the bottom here and call GND. Now you may not notice anything different that has happened. Um, that's because we just simply haven't hit the rat's nest button again. Now the rat's nest, is, as you remember, basically recalculates all of our connections. So once we do, do that, it takes into account these polygons and it connects it to the appropriate uh, components that it should be connected to. So I click rat's nest and there we go. We can see our ground pour. Now you can see that it covers up almost the entire board and there's just these tiny little areas to the side where it's not connected. So you notice that it really doesn't give us very much clearance at all, kind of between our, our pore and our connections. And that's generally, it's, it's a little bit sketchy. We want to make that a little bit better. So the way we do that is we go to, um, let's see, edit, and then down to net classes. Now net classes is where we're basically able to give the machine um, our own set of rules for how it should be laying things out. So the width is basically the minimum width that it's going to give traces. And this, this primarily comes in for the auto router. It's going to say 10M for now. The drill is the amount of uh, space it gives between traces and drills, um, and which is usually more than uh, between other traces because you are screwing screws into uh, drill holes, which may short your circuit. And clearance is the one we're really interested in. So clearance basically says um, you have one trace here, you have another trace there. Um, I'm going to create an empty space in between these traces according to whatever distance you put in clearance here. So to sort of exaggerate the process, I'm going to put 30 mil, and that is a thousandth of an inch, it's not millimeters there. Um, mil is different than mm. And press OK. And I'm going to hit the rest nest button again. As you can see, all these sorts of areas that are surrounding our leads have gotten much bigger and we have this sort of nice healthy space between um, our leads and the connections and that's sort of nice. Um, so we're going to you know, maybe not want to go as extreme as that, we'll cut it back to maybe 20 mil or so. Alright, and then we'll kind of zoom out and get a, get a general picture of our board here. Alright. So. Now, the reason why this connection right here kind of looks funky and it has this sort of pink instead of the black on the side is actually because this connection is on the bottom layer. <laughs> so if we click right here, this is basically all the different layers that are currently uh, visible to us. So if we unclick the top here and press OK, it's going to show the bottom layer and it's not going to show the top layer. And then we can see how, how this is sort of connected here. Alright, excellent. 
And you can see where the ground pore is actually connected as well. So you can see how there's these sort of lines coming out from this connection, and that's where it would normally be attached to a lead that's going to ground, but is instead just attached to the ground pore as well. And you can say, see the same thing happening here. Um, both this pin is attached to the ground pore as, as well as this guy right here. So we have no need for this connection that used to be right there. All right, so I know this, this board isn't very pretty, and maybe we could have designed it so this LED switches on the other side, and that's something you should definitely do once you're designing your own board. But the purpose of this demonstration is basically to just kind of show you the basic workflow for Eagle, not specifically how to design the best board in the world. So um, for the purposes of um, this video, we are basically done with this board. So I'm going to hit Command S to save it, and I'm going to save it as LED switch. Sure. Alright, and hit enter, and it's going to save it. So now if we open up Finder, and uh, if we go to Documents, and Eagle, and Example, which is where by default it saves as Eagle Projects. Now you, you can change this yourself um, and, and give it um, your own path if you desire. But we should see our project in here. So we have the Eagle, we have our board, and then we have the schematic as well. So let's send this off to Oshpark. So we go back to the Oshpark website here and click on Home. And their home page is basically allows you to load up your Eagle files and um, kind of get a quote instantaneously. So we're going to click on the Get Started Now and click on Select the File from your computer. Or actually before that, so you can read here. So it says you can upload designs in Eagle board file or zip containing Gerber CAM file. So Gerber is a... Um, it's basically a filing convention that's, that's used a lot for PCB design. Um, the idea of the Gerber is that for each one of those layers, you get a different file. So there's a file for the drills, there's a file for the top layer, there's a file for the silk screen, etc., etc. And it's just kind of in um, a vectorized file format where it tells the machine, you know, how far away these different components are to each other, and basically tells the uh, PCB manufacturers how to manufacture the board. But uh, the nice thing about Oshpark is they do accept Eagle board files as well, so you don't have to go through the process of exporting Gerbers and dealing with that, which is actually, quite frankly, a little bit of a headache. So I'm going to click on Select File on your computer, and we're going to go to Document, Eagle, Example, LED switcher, and then we're going to grab the .brd, which is the Eagle board file. I'm going to hit enter, press open. <coughs> we're going to give Eagle or uh, Oshpark a second to sort of analyze the, the project and figure out what's going on. So we'll call this LED switcher best project ever. All right. So I continue, and it shows us what it's going to make for our board. Now you can see this isn't exactly what we expected, right? There's all this sort of extra area around. And that's because we forgot, and that brings up a very important part. So if we open up the Eagle file, and go back to our um, board here, you notice that this bounding box is surrounding our shield. That is the same area that Oshpark thinks that our board is. So once we created our board here, we actually have to kind of bring in these boundaries and restrict it a little bit. So we do this by using the move tool. So I'm going to type in move, I'm going to click on the corner, and that gives me access to move it. I'm just going to bring it down to this corner right here. I'm going to do that for all the sides and bring our uh, dimensions down. I don't really care about this like little lip right here. Who cares? It doesn't really need to be on my shield. And the thing is, is that the, the manufacturers charge you on a per square inch basis. So the more area that you have on the board, the more you're actually going to be paying for it. All right, I'm going to hold down the alt key and bring out the um, the alternate grid to give me a little bit more fine control. All right, there we go. I don't want to cut off too much of the, the corner here. All right, so that looks good. I'm going to save again, and we're going to do the same thing. And this time, instead of you know seeing all this extra space, we're going to see the, the area of the board that we expected. So we're going to go to get started now. And that's a really nice thing about Oshpark is it gives you that instant feedback. It shows you what they're going to manufacture. You're not going to have to wait in two weeks until they make the board, send it back to you, and you're like, oh, shit, it's three times the size of what I thought. You know, that totally sucks. Um, I'm going to call this uh, LED switcher. I'm going to hit continue. You can see this is a little bit closer to what we expected. So we have our, our square shield, we have uh, the holes where it plugs into Arduino, we have the silk screens for our components, etc. etc. 
all right? So it shows you the board top, it shows you the board bottom, it shows you your drill holes, it shows you your top layer of copper, it shows you the bottom solder mask, it shows you top solder mask, bottom layer, it shows you all that sort of stuff, right? So that's pretty cool. And you can be like, approve. And then it's gonna add it to your boards, right? Now, if I go to order now, this is also pretty cool. It tells me how much it's going to cost. So this little Arduino shield that we made is going to cost us $24 to get sent off, and we're going to get three of them. So it's about, you know, $7 or so board, which is pretty fantastic, actually. Now, Oshpark uh, charges on a per square inch basis, generally. If your board is very, very complex and has tons of vias and drill holes, they may charge you a little bit more. So that's why it's generally a good idea to um, make your boards as small as possible. Um, so yeah, so that's the basic workflow for how to kind of get through Eagle to, to make a simple project and send it off to the fab. Um, by no means this is, you know, the best design ever, or um, I definitely glossed over many, many different aspects and many uh, big parts of, of creating a PCB with Eagle. So, um, you know, reach out to me if you have any further questions or whatever. And um, yeah, I hope that was helpful. All right, later guys.